Hello. In this video, we're going to be talking about polynomial functions and power functions. Now, power functions are all polynomials. So polynomials is the bigger group. Power functions are a type of polynomial function. So for example, let's think about living in Colorado and living in the United States. If you live in Colorado, you definitely live in the United States. So if you're a power function, you're definitely a polynomial. But not everyone in the United States lives in Colorado and not all polynomials are power functions. So let's write down some examples of each and let's talk about what makes something a power function and why we might call it a power function and what makes something a polynomial. Let's go ahead and get started while I share my screen with you. So let's see, let's go ahead and define each one. So first off, we want to define a polynomial function. Now we're gonna break this apart by looking at the roots of this word polynomial. So polynomial functions, poly means many in most cases, and nomial, at least in terms of mathematics, means term, so many terms. But in fact, a polynomial could consist of just one term. Now, this is all great as long as you know what a term is. So let's define what a term is. A term is an expression divided or separated from other things by plus signs, minus signs, and equal signs or inequalities. So this is an expression separated from other expressions plus, minus, equals, less than, greater than, less than, equal to, greater than, equal to from other expressions. where, and there's a there's a, uh, a trick to this one, or there's a, a catch to this one, where the plus or minus is not in parentheses or the numerator or denominator of a fraction. So not in parentheses, not in a fraction, and not in a radical and not in an absolute value. Now, what does this mean exactly? Let me go ahead and spell out absolute value. So when we're talking about terms, we're talking about things that are added and subtracted together. It's really not as difficult as the definition makes it seem. We just have to be very precise in mathematics. So what we're talking about, for example, would be something that looks like 2x plus 3y. Now that's a mathematical expression. It's not an equation because it doesn't have an equals or an inequality in two sides. So it's not an equation. It's actually an expression, but it does consist of two terms separated by the plus sign that's out in the open. And that's what I usually call it, out in the open. It's not buried in parentheses, not inside of a fraction, not underneath a radical, not in an absolute value. It's just out there in the open. Right, so we would call this one term and we would call this one term. And because there are two terms, we would call this a binomial, meaning there are two terms. So a polynomial means one or many. And in this case, a binomial means precisely two. Now we could just have a single term. So we could have something like 3x squared. There's no plus sign, no minus sign, no equal, no inequality, nothing to separate. And so this is a single term, and this is called a monomial. And in fact, both of these happen to be polynomials. Now, the first one is a polynomial in x and y, and the second is a polynomial only in x. Now, what makes a polynomial and why these terms? Let's again go over what makes a term, and then we'll talk about what makes something a polynomial and what doesn't. So if I had something like 3x 
plus 2 divided by 4 plus 5x equals 7, how many terms do I have? As it's currently written, this plus sign in the numerator of the fraction does not separate terms. It separates terms in the numerator, but not in the overall equation. So in fact, we would consider the entire fraction to be one term. And then the second term would be the 5x separated by the plus and the equal sign. And the constant 7 counts as a term all by itself. And this would become a trinomial. Now it is in fact a polynomial because I could, if I wanted to, I could separate out that 3x plus 2 divided by 4 and divide each term individually by 4. So I could have 3 fourths x to the first plus 2 fourths, which of course reduces to 1 half, plus 5x equals 7. But this no longer is a trinomial. Now I have brought that plus sign that was in the numerator out into the open. And so actually now I have four terms. So this is a four term polynomial. Now, what makes something a polynomial and what does not? In general, you have to be able to write it with all variables in the numerator with whole number exponents. So have to be able to doesn't mean that you have, it just means that you can, all right? So let's define the polynomial now that we know what a term is. A polynomial consists of one or more terms. I don't know why I keep erasing. This is one, so it could be a monomial or more terms with, and now we have some, some catches to this. First off, the coefficients of each term have to be real. Now they don't have to be integers. They don't have to be like negative three or two or five or seven. They could be like pi or e or the square root of two or the cube root of a negative 11. Those are all real numbers. They show up on the real number line. They may be non-terminating, non-repeating decimals. That's irrational but they're still real. They show up on the number line. In other words, no I. We can't have any I's running around. So one or more terms with real coefficients. And again, we'll give some examples of what are real numbers. So this could be two, five, negative four, pi, E, one third, all fractions, nine fourths, square root of two, cube root of negative 11, all of those count as real numbers. So basically what we're talking about here is no I, right? And then what about the next part? Okay, so one or more terms, we know all our coefficients, the number out front of each term has to be some kind of real number, no I involved. So no square root of a negative, no fourth root of a negative, no even root of a negative. That's basically the rule. But there's more to it than that. It has to be able to be written with all variables in the numerator with whole number exponents. So must be able, doesn't mean it has to be written this way, but must be able to be written with all variables in the numerator in the numerator. So talking about a fraction, it doesn't have to have a fraction. It could be over one. So in the numerator, boy, I'm running out of room, with whole number exponents. Okay, great. Now we have this lovely definition, but you need to know what a whole number is. And I'm running out of room, exponent. Okay, whole numbers, what are whole numbers? Well, whole numbers are pretty much the concept of numbers that you have when you're three or four years old. You understand no cookies, right? That's zero cookies. You've got that concept. You can have one cookie, two cookies, three cookies, but you really don't want zero cookies. However, you don't really get the whole negative three, negative one, negative two, and all that. 
And you certainly don't want to even think about half of the cookie. So what we're talking about here are the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, and the number zero. Zero is the only whole number that's not a counting number. So what we're talking about here are these numbers right here, three, four, and so on, right? So these are the ones you tend to mark off in the number line, but it doesn't include any of the negative integers. So what we're looking at is this definition right here. This is what a polynomial is, one or more terms. And again, terms are things that are separated by pluses and minuses or equals, that's most of the time, or an inequality symbol counts too. But the plus or minus cannot be inside parentheses, inside a fraction, not under a radical or in an absolute value. It's gotta be out in the open in the expression or the equation. Now, this is an expression because there's no equals or inequality. And this down here is an equation because we have an equals and we have something on both sides. And we were able to count how many different terms. And I said that all of these were, in fact, polynomials. So let's see how they fit that definition. The coefficient 2 is a real number. We can find that on the real number line. X is written in the numerator. Why? Because I can put it over 1. So that makes it a fraction. And the power on x is a positive one, all right? So that makes it um, a polynomial term. And then I can look at the three y. Three is also a real number. Y is raised to the first power. So this meets my definition, right? One is a whole number, so it meets my definition. What about this one right here by itself? Three is a real number. X is being raised to the second power. Two is a whole number, so it counts. It's in the numerator, so it's okay. Looking at this one right here, as written, it looks a little confusing. But again, keep in mind that this can be written in this way right here. Now I've got three fours. So the four is in the denominator, but the x is not. The x is in the numerator with a positive one power. That is a whole number, so it counts as a term. And that makes it a polynomial. Two fourths is a constant. All constants are considered polynomials. They're kind of trivial ones. Trivial meaning um, not easy, but sort of simpler in some way than other things. And then 5x, 5 is a real number. X is being raised to the first, and then 7 is a constant. And all constants are polynomials. So all of these, in fact, are polynomial expressions or equations. Now let's take a look at something that might also be, we'll look at a couple different ones. So let's write three over X equals seven X. So I have something like this. All right, so is this a polynomial equation as it's written? Now, this one actually has some, some kind of tricks to it. If I were looking at just the term three divided by X, that would not be polynomial at all, right? However, if I wanted to, could I rewrite this in some different way? I could rewrite it as 7x squared equal 3 with the caveat that x cannot equal to 0. Now, written in this form, I would not consider it polynomial because I have x in the denominator and the power is a 1 and that leaves it in the denominator and that's not polynomial. But written in this form, Yes, it is, in fact, um, a polynomial. So we have x raised to the second power with coefficient 7, and 3 is a polynomial. Why can x not be 0? Well, because x was originally in the denominator. Let's take a look at another one. Let's say that I had some expression like x squared plus 1 over x minus um, 7. All right, when I'm looking at this one right here, x squared, that does count as a polynomial term. The coefficient's not written, but it's one, which is real. The power on x is two, which is a whole number. The negative seven, we know all constants count as polynomial terms. They're actually kind of simple. Uh, one way that we can think of them is negative seven times x to the zero. Now, why x to the zero? Well, x to the zero is the number one, so negative seven times one is still negative seven. But x to the zero counts as a polynomial because zero is a whole number. 
That's why all constant terms are considered to be polynomials. And then we can take a look at this one over X term. Now, this is a problem. I don't have it equal to anything, so I can't multiply through by X and leave off X equals zero to move that X out of the denominator. I'm stuck. I've got one over X and it's one over X to the first. So it's gonna stay in the denominator. And that's a problem. That means this is not a polynomial, okay? Now, Let's take in another example. I could have something like the square root of x minus three um, equal to four, right? So what about this? Is this a polynomial? I mean, the coefficient here is one, which is real. This is a constant, this is a constant. What about this square root of x? Well, remember that radicals can be written as rational exponents, the ratio of two integers. So the square root is actually the one half power. And this gives me this expression right here, or this equation right here. So I have x to the one half. Well, one half is not a whole number. So again, we're talking about counting numbers plus zero. So this is not a polynomial. All right, now let's look at another example. And this one, I'm gonna do two examples sort of side by side. Um, because I want to compare and contrast how they're a little bit different. So let's do something like x cubed minus 7x squared plus 4 over x to the negative 1 minus 3. And then over here, let's take a look at um, x to the fifth plus x to the fourth divided by x squared plus x, all right? So now we've got this expression here. Now I've got two different expressions. One of these actually is a polynomial and the other one is not. So again, the rule is real coefficients, which both of these have real coefficients. There are no i's running around. Um, but only one of these can be written with all the variables x in the numerator with whole number exponents. Now, right now, looking at this particular one right here, we've got this x to the third. That is a polynomial term, right? You've got one for the coefficient and three for the power, which is a counting number. And then you've got negative seven x squared. Negative seven is real. Power two is a counting number. And then we've got this interesting four divided by x to the negative one. Now remember that a negative power is a position changer. So, and there's only two places to be in the numerator and the denominator of a fraction. So we'll switch it from numerator to denominator provided it's a factor. That means it can only be multiplied or divided with other things. It can't be added or subtracted. So in this case, what I can do is I can rewrite this one as x cubed minus seven x squared plus four x minus three. And that clearly makes this one a polynomial, right? Now, what about this one over here? Now I could factor out the x and reduce it with the x to the fourth in the numerator, but there's no way to get these out of the denominator. They do not have negative exponents, and even if they did, and I'll do one in just a second where they do, they're added together, so I can't move them, right? So I'm going to have to leave them as is, and that means that this one is not a polynomial. There's no way to rewrite this so that all the x's are in the numerator with positive whole number exponents, right? Now I said I would give you an example of one where they're actually, um, so let's do the square root of two x to the seventh minus x over x to the negative two plus four. Okay, it is so tempting. I know it is tempting to want to move that x to the negative two to the numerator, but it's being added to four. All right, so can we do this or can we not? Is there another way to write this? Now let's see if there is, there may be, there may not be. 
So sometimes this is not a trivial question. This is not something that's simple. Sometimes determining what is a polynomial and what is not by looking at the expression or the equation is actually quite difficult. Now, remember that the negative power is a position marker. So really x to the negative two represents one divided by x squared. So I know the square root of two is real and the x to the seventh, seven is a whole number. So this term is polynomial, but I don't know about the second one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this one. And now I'm gonna have one over x squared plus four. All right. so. I, I've done that. Now, this looks like one over x squared and it becomes a complex fraction, which is just a fancy way of saying fraction within a fraction. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply top and bottom by the common denominator of the little denominators, which is x squared. So I'm gonna multiply by x squared over one over x squared over one. So I'm scrolling down where I have a little bit more room. This square root of two x to the seventh stays there. X squared times x. Now remember, I have to multiply by one so I don't change things. So I'm not allowed to just multiply the bottom by x squared. So this is gonna give me a minus x cubed in the numerator. And I have to distribute in the denominator because of the plus sign. So this will give me a one, woo hoo, got rid of that. Um, so now I don't have that problem with the one over x squared, but notice that this other one shifted over and now I have plus four x squared. Darn it. All right. I still have x in the denominator, which I don't want if it's a polynomial. Now the question is, can I reduce? And the answer is no, no, no. All right. So don't make that mistake. You have a plus sign. The only thing that cancels are factors, things only multiplied or divided. In other words, you would have to um, factor out the x squared and you can't factor out the x squared because the one doesn't have an x squared. This is not a polynomial, All right? Now we've talked about how to determine if something is polynomial or not. Let's talk for a second about what a power function is. So a power function is really a, a special case of a polynomial. So let's look at a power function. A power function is a single term polynomial. In other words, it's a monomial. Now, most of the time we consider the power to be, well, one or higher. And in most cases, really, when we're talking about power functions, we're really talking about two or higher because one is kind of boring. That's just the line, right? Um, so, and zero would also be a line. It would be a horizontal line. So let's, let's talk about that so that we're sure we understand. These are functions. All of these are functions. So they do pass the vertical line test. If I had something like y equal five, remember that this can be written as y equal five x to the zero, right? So the zeroth power, of course, does qualify as a polynomial. What does it look like when you graph it? Well, it's actually quite boring. Um, it's just a horizontal line up here at five, right? It's not really a power function, it doesn't have any power. Um, we mostly talk about power functions being power two or greater. Now, what about x to the first? I mean, technically, I suppose it's a power function. So we have y equal, I don't know, let's make it two x to the first power. All right, so this is a polynomial function. And what does this look like? Well, if I were to graph this one, um, this one is actually going to have a graph. It's going to go up twice as fast, right? It's a slanted line going through the origin, right? So it goes up like this. Now, these aren't, these are sort of what I would call trivial, which in mathematics either means simpler than other things or, and this is a secondary meaning, weird and degenerate and not like the other things in the group. And that's what these two are. They're trivial power functions. They don't match the rest of the power functions. So we're gonna primarily be looking at power functions with power two and higher. 
because they share characteristics that these two do not. All right, so let's talk about power functions where the power is two or higher. Okay, power functions two or higher, where the power is greater than or equal to two. Now, we just talked in the previous section about quadratic functions, so you know what a quadratic looks like, right? So we're going to talk about the basic quadratic function, f of x equals x squared. We know what that looks like. It's a parabola, right? And it goes, oh, I erased my parabola. It's not good. Looks like that vertex here at the origin, all right? So that's basically the parabola. Now, the next power function would be a cubic, and these are the basic ones, so the coefficient is one. But of course, the coefficient doesn't have to be one. To be a power function, it just has to be a single term with some real coefficient and a power on the variable that is greater than one, right? So let's talk about what it looks like when f of x equals x cubed, right? So we've got this, oh, drat, all right? I keep holding my finger around the erase button. All right, so it looks like this. Remember, as it approaches the origin, it comes flatter and flatter and approaches horizontal and boom, right at the origin, it goes horizontal for one instant and then it goes back up again. So this is also a power function, it's x cubed. Now, what would happen if we did x to the fourth or x to the fifth or x to the sixth? Let's take a look on Desmos and see what happens when we increase the powers. Okay, so I've gone ahead and I've graphed some of the even power functions here. You see x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth. What do you notice about these graphs? The one in red right here that you see this is x squared, which has the normal parabolic shape that we're used to. Now, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, and x to the eighth all share this point right here at the origin. In other words, they all still have a point that is lower than all the others. All right, so it's, it's their vertex. But notice that between zero and one, and between zero and negative one, the higher the power, the flatter the graph gets in here. Now, it looks like they're sitting on the axis. So let's scroll in and see if they're really sitting on the axis or if, in fact, they're pulled away. So as we get in closer and closer, what do you notice about these graphs? They're actually not on the axis. It looks like they are, but they're not. I don't care how far you need to go in, they are only touching the graph at one place, and that's at the origin. So in fact, they get flatter and flatter between negative one and one because, of course, they're fractions, proper fractions, where the numerator is smaller than the denominator. And when you raise it to a power, a fraction gets even smaller. So it gets flatter and approaches zero. Now. That means that they all have the basic shape of the parabola, except the higher the power, the flatter it gets, the wider this flattish section is. But it's not horizontal. It still is cut with one low point right at the origin. And then what happens when we get outside of that region, when we go from one to infinity or from negative one to negative infinity? The higher the power, the faster it increases and goes towards infinity. And so you can see that as these get higher powers, they become more vertical-like, not vertical, vertical-like. They still tilt outwards forever, which means the domain of these functions, these even degree power functions, is still all reals. The domain, in fact, of all polynomials is all reals. This is why there are a number one favorite class of functions. No question, we adore these things. Their domain is all reals. They're super easy. 
When you get into calculus, we love them because they're continuous everywhere, differentiable everywhere, and integrable everywhere. But we're in college algebra, so we won't get into that. But again, they are the nicest, most well-behaved class of functions we have. We love these guys. Now let's take a look at the odd degrees. So here's x cubed. It's the one in red that you see right here. And then x to the fifth is blue, x to the seventh is green, x to the ninth is purple. Notice they all have the basic shape of that cubic, except between negative one and one, the higher the power, the wider there's a section where it's flat-ish. But again, it's never horizontal. They all still have that one spot where it goes horizontal, that's at the origin. No matter how much you scroll in here, you're gonna see that these are not actually touching the x-axis until they get to the origin. Now, what about outside of negative one to one? From one to infinity or negative one down to negative infinity, the higher the power, the faster it grows. And that means that it becomes more vertical. It's never vertical. They're still tilted outwards. I like to think of these as sort of like John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. I mean, that's what an odd power function looks like. It looks like this. So how do you get one going one way and one going the other? Well, to get one going the other way, you need to, of course, reflect it. And so if you reflect it, it goes the other way again, right? So that's basically what we have going on here. We have odd power functions and even power functions. All the odd power functions basically behave like x cubed, but they get flatter in that section between negative one and one, and they go up more quickly, more steeply outside of that, from negative infinity to negative one and from one to infinity. And on the even degree power functions, they basically behave like x squared, except between negative one and one, they get flatter, closer to horizontal, but never horizontal until right at that instant at the origin, they have a lowest spot. And then between uh, negative infinity and negative one and one to infinity, they go up more steeply than the x squared graph does. But again, they never go up vertical, they still tilt outward. You notice that the domain for both of these graphs is going to be all reals. Now, the range for the power functions, notice that the power functions are right here. The range for a power function that has an even power is going to be zero to infinity. That's going to be the range. But on the odds, because they have this stretching in both directions behavior, their range is also all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. So now that we've talked about what power functions are and what polynomial functions are, and again, these are not all the types of functions there are. There are many other types, radical functions, rational functions, logarithmic functions, exponential functions. That's what we're going to be exploring over the next couple of chapters. So let's go ahead and turn our attention now to the homework questions, and let's see if we can answer some of these questions. So here is problem number one. So hopefully you can read this at home. Is f of x equal to x plus three over x plus two a polynomial power function, both a power function and a polynomial function or neither? Well, first off, we've discussed that all power functions are polynomial functions. So you should never answer it's a power function by itself. It's, it's always gonna be both power and polynomial but there are some that are polynomial that are not power functions. And again, a power function is a monomial. It's a single term polynomial. So when you have multiple terms like this one right here, it can't possibly be a power function, but it is a polynomial function. This one we say is actually a cubic function. And I'll show you how it's a little bit different um, than the regular x cubed function in just a moment. We'll see what the effect of these other three terms here has on the graph. All right, so looking at this right here, remember the keys to a polynomial, real coefficients, no eyes running around. Okay, well, coefficients of x are both one and I've got a three and a two. Those do not have eyes in them, so that's fine. 
Second thing, one or more terms. Well, it's a single fraction, so it's one term. That's okay. All right. Next thing, I have to be able to write it with all variables in the numerator with whole number exponents. And this is where I fall down. I cannot get this X out of the denominator. So I've got an X in the denominator right here, and there's no way for me to get that out of the denominator. This is not a polynomial function, can't possibly be a power function if it's not polynomial. So it's neither one. So we're gonna say neither. Let's check our answer. Love the green, right? You gotta love the green. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Is f of x equal 2x cubed minus 1x plus 5? Polynomial power, both power and polynomial, or neither one. Again, real coefficients, 2, negative 1, 5. Those are all real, no i's running around. Let's look at our variables. The variables are all written as if in the numerator, right? No variable in the denominator or fraction. What powers do they have? They can only have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, et cetera. So I've got a three on the first term and a one on the second term, and then I've got a five by itself. But the five could be written as five X to the zero, so that counts. So yeah, it's a polynomial function, definitely a polynomial. There are three terms in it. Two X cubed is one, negative one X is the second, five is the third, separated by the subtraction and the plus. Now, is it a power function? It can't be, it's three terms. Right, a power function is only a monomial. So this is a polynomial function, but not a power function. Right, let's take a look at problem number three. F of X equal one over X minus four. Okay, now our, our numbers, our coefficients and our numbers are all real. So that's not a problem. I have one term, that's not a problem but I've got X in the denominator and that is a problem. There's no way for me to get that X out of the denominator. I could write X minus four quantity to the negative one, but negative one is not a whole number. It's not zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So this is neither one. All right, so let's give it a check and move on to problem number four. What about this one? Oh, they tricked me up. Okay, so I've got a four, an X plus one cubed, and an X plus one. Yipes. Okay, uh, well, this isn't in any of the forms that I looked at before. Hmm, bugger. Okay, so what am I gonna do? Well, first let's check out the coefficients. I've got a four, the coefficients of both axes is a one, and then I've got a plus one in each one. All the coefficients are real. I don't have any i's. Nothing that I do by multiplying this out is going to introduce an i. So they have real coefficients. I'm not worried about that. I don't even know what they are if I multiplied them out, but I know they'd be real. All right. Well, what would happen if I did x plus one times itself three times? Well, actually, I mean, I don't know why they wrote it this way. This is really x plus one times itself four times, right? x plus one cubed times x plus one is really x plus one to the fourth. Okay, what would happen if I did that? Well, I'd get a lot of terms. I definitely have an x to the fourth, probably an x to the third, x squared, x, and probably a constant at the end. Okay, would multiplying this out ever give me an x in the denominator? No, nothing's in the denominator. It's not gonna do it. It's gonna introduce, some kind of radical? No. Well, here's the thing. It turns out that the product of polynomials is a polynomial, and a polynomial to a power is also a polynomial. So looking at this, x plus one is a polynomial. When I cube a polynomial, I get a polynomial. And when I multiply a polynomial by a polynomial, I get a polynomial. The only one that can cause problems is division. Dividing a polynomial by a polynomial does not guarantee that I get a polynomial. Sometimes I do, sometimes I get a rational function, which is not polynomial. So if I add polynomials, subtract polynomials, or multiply polynomials, I'm guaranteed to still have a polynomial. If I raise a polynomial to a whole number power, I'm guaranteed to still have a polynomial. If 
I raise a polynomial to a fractional power, it's not polynomial anymore. If I raise it to a negative power, it's not polynomial anymore. The power has to be a whole number. But based on that, I can say that this is still going to be a polynomial, but it's going to have lots of term. It's not going to be a power function. So this will be polynomial. All right. Now we want to talk about the degree and leading coefficient. So let's go back to some of our examples over here where we were talking about polynomials and let's talk about the degree and leading coefficient. Now degree depends on the single term with the highest power in it. If you have two variables involved, an x and a y, you add those powers together and that represents the power of the whole term. So if I had three x squared y, I would take the two from the x and the one from the y and that will give me a, a degree of three for that term. Most of the time, we're just gonna deal with functions of a single variable, variable x. So when I'm looking at that, if I look at this right here, the power on x is one, so this term has degree one and this term has degree one. So I would say this expression is degree one. Now, this one, as far as the leading coefficient, it depends on what you're considering to be um, the primary variable. In this case, probably x, so two would be the leading coefficient. Looking at three x squared, which is a polynomial, the degree of this term is two, and the coefficient attached to it is three. So the leading coefficient is three, and the degree is two. Now, this one right here, written out in this form, I've got a power of one on x here. The degree of all constant terms, again, is zero because it can be written as the constant times x to the zero. So all constant terms are degree zero. So that's degree zero, that's degree one, and that's degree zero. The biggest one in the whole equation is degree one, so it's degree one. And to get the leading coefficient, I would need to go ahead and combine these two terms together. I have like terms, and then whatever coefficient I got, that would be the leading coefficient. Let's take a look now at some of the examples that we have down here. This one right here, I've got an x cubed, an x squared, an x to the first, and an x to the zero. So I've got degree three, degree two, degree one, degree zero. Looking at the x cubed um, minus seven x squared plus four x minus three. So looking at this one right here, the highest degree in the whole thing, and it is polynomial, is degree three. So it's degree three. And the leading coefficient is the degree attached to the highest degree term. So the number attached here is one. So I would say that this one is degree three and the leading coefficient equals a one. Now, why do we care? Well, it turns out that degree three problems are all gonna look basically very similar to that power function x cubed, except in the middle. Now it's time to talk about what happens. So let me graph this one, negative seven, four, negative three. All right, so x to the third minus seven x squared, and I've already forgotten the rest of it, plus four x minus three. Okay, plus four x minus three. All right, so there's my cubic, and I wanna compare it to another degree three, the power function. Now let's scroll out a little bit so that you can see what's going on. And I'm actually gonna change the scale a little bit. So I want X to go from negative five to five. And you may be saying, well, why are you making it so narrow? Well, it turns out that sometimes it's hard to get everything on here that you need. So nine's probably okay, but 15 doesn't look nearly low enough. So let's go down to negative 40. Okay, all right, now come back over here and let's take a look. So 
what happens with those other terms is it can produce a wiggle. I know, what else are you gonna call it? Turning points. It produces like a wave, but it's a smooth wave, right? It's not jagged, it's not pointy, it's not like connect the dots. So it produced this dip that you see right here. Now, if I were to look at this from very far away, do you see how that wiggle becomes less and less important and the graph of the red function begins to look more and more like the blue function, the power function? Well, that's basically what happens. They do the same things as x goes to positive infinity or x goes to negative infinity. They do the same things. But in the middle, where the numbers are smaller and small is relative, it might be between negative 500 and 500, but in the middle, there could be a difference in that one of them that has multiple terms could wiggle. It doesn't have to, but it could. All right, so let's go ahead and scroll back in and you can see this wiggle here. Now there's more to it than that. The degree actually determines how many times it can wiggle. Who knew? Okay, all right, so here's the thing. The turning points are gonna be one less than the degree. That's the maximum number of turning points, but it doesn't have to turn. If we look at the cubic right here, the degree is three, but it doesn't have any turning points, right? No turning points at all. It does get flat here, but it doesn't turn around and head the other direction. So it doesn't have a turning point or what I'd call a hill or a valley, all right? A local maximum or a local minimum, not the biggest or smallest on the graph, but the biggest in that area, right? So this is what we call a turning point where it turns around and goes the other direction. And there are two turning points in here, which makes sense because that equation was cubic, third power, three minus one is two. So at most it has two turning points. Now, if we have a cubic, it has to look like this or like this, which means if it has a turning point, it in fact has to have two because it's got to go up forever, right? This is what we call the end behavior. So the end behavior of a cubic is that it always goes towards positive infinity as x goes to infinity and towards negative infinity as x goes towards negative infinity. That's what we call the end behavior. What does it look like from a bird's eye view, way, way, way far out where we don't really notice the wiggles or the flat parts that much? What's happening on the far edges of the graph? And what's happening is this is going up forever and this is going up forever and this is going down forever and this is going down forever. So it turns out that these turning points that we have right here, either we have zero turning points or we have two turning points, right? So they kind of come in pairs. Now let's take a look um, at another one. See, did I write another one? I did not. Okay, so let's go back to our problem. It says find the degree and leading coefficient for y equal negative 10x minus 6x to the fourth plus 9x squared. Okay, first off, normally we write polynomials in what we call descending order. So let's copy this problem down. Negative 10x minus six x to the fourth plus nine x squared. Okay, so we have y equal negative 10 x plus, no, minus six x to the fourth plus nine x squared. Okay, is this polynomial? Yes, I have a negative 10 coefficient, a negative six coefficient, and nine coefficient. What are the powers on the variable? They're all in the numerator, one, four, and two, bingo. All right, is it a power function? No, it's three terms. Which one has the highest degree? The middle one. Well, then you should have written that guy first. So, and the sign goes with it. So it's negative six X to the fourth. What's the next highest degree? The nine X squared. So plus nine X squared. 
And then which one has the smallest degree of all the terms present? Minus 10x. All right, what's the overall degree of this polynomial? It is degree four. And the leading coefficient is the coefficient attached to that term, which is negative six. Now, why is this important? Because this one, at least on the edges, not necessarily in the middle, but on the edges, is going to graph like the power function, negative x to the fourth. And you may go, whoa, you just blew my mind. How'd you know that? All right. Well, first off, it's degree four, and the leading coefficient is negative. So it's going to have end behavior like y equal negative x to the fourth. Now, what does y equal negative x to the fourth look like? Let's remind ourselves. Okay, if we come over here to our even degrees and I put a negative on my x to the fourth, bingo, it flips it down. In other words, instead of being up and kind of flat in the middle, it's, I'm not sure I can do this, down and sort of flattish in the middle, all right? So that's my negative x to the fourth. Now, what do I mean by it has end behavior that looks like that? Well, what does this do as you go way to the left? It goes down towards negative infinity. What does this do as you go way to the right? It goes down towards negative infinity again. Okay, so coming over here, this graph that I have right here has to come down towards negative infinity on both the left and the right. And you'll notice there's a gap in here. So what happens in the middle? Well, either it does what that one does and it kind of gets flat or it may wiggle, all right? Now, how many times could it wiggle? How many turning points could it have? So let's talk about turning points. Turning points, maximum, max equals degree minus one. So in this case, it's gotta be three. So at most I have three. Now, what does that mean? They come in pairs, so I either have three or I have one, which means I have to have one. Well, of course I have to have one. Remember, polynomials are smooth and connected. Their domain is all real. There are no gaps in these graphs. So they go for everywhere. You have to be able to draw it without lifting it. So either it looks like this, where there's one turning point, something like that, or let me do this one in red. It wiggles once, but it can't just wiggle once. It can wiggle one time or three times. So then it wiggles again, and then it wiggles again. All right, it has to, because it has the same end behavior as negative x to the fourth. Now, do I really know what it looks like? No, I don't, so let's go graph it. Negative 6x to the fourth, 9x squared minus 10x. Six, nine, 10. Negative 6x to the fourth. Oh, God, I've already lost it. Uh, 9x squared minus 10x plus 9x squared. Is it plus 10x or minus 10x? I think it's minus 10x. Yeah. Okay. Whoa. All right. Well, one thing we can do is let's turn off these other even ones. We'll leave on the x to the four since we know that bird's eye view, it's got to look like that. All right. Now, whoa, what's happening here? Well, it's it's got some wiggles in here, right? It's got some wiggles. So it's coming up, it's turning around and coming down, right? Now in here, does it wiggle again? Well, actually it doesn't look like it does, right? So let's scoot this over a little bit. Scroll in to look at that black graph. No, it doesn't wiggle again, but it does kind of shift over a little bit. So this one actually has one turning point, but it does have this weird kind of dive over here in the middle. In other words, they can do all kinds of things in that middle section, but as X goes far to the right, the graph here has to do the same thing as the blue graph does and go to negative infinity. 
And as x goes to the far right, again, the graph does the same thing. So their end behavior is the same. Now, when we write end behavior, we tend to say, as x goes to infinity, what we're talking about is y, which is actually the function, it goes to negative infinity. And as x goes to negative infinity, y, which is the function f of x, also again goes to negative infinity. Now, why do we use arrows? Because infinity is not a number, right? It's a direction, so it can't be equal to it. It's just approaching it. All right, so now let's go back to our problem over here. We decided that this was actually degree four because that was the highest degree in any one term. And the leading coefficient is the coefficient attached to that term, which is negative six. And we can check our answers and we get lovely greens. Okay, let's take a look at this guy. We have y equal nine x, which is, actually a line, right? It's slope of nine goes through the origin. The degree, there's only one term on the right-hand side. It's the nine X. It is a function. And so our degree is going to be one because that's the power on X and the coefficient attached to it is nine. So we can check our answers and we get greens. So we move on. Looking at this next one, 9x squared plus 8x plus 1. Again, it's polynomial. 9, 8, and 1 are all real. No i's running around. The powers on x are 2, 1, and then x to the 0 is not written, but we could write it. And then looking at these, the degree is going to be the highest in any one term. Remember, terms are separated by plus, minus, equals, out in the open. All right, so degree two, degree one, degree zero, two is the highest. It is actually written first, and the coefficient attached to that is nine. All right, moving on more quickly now. Determine the end behavior for y equal four x to the fourth. Well, we know what the end behavior is going to be. Even degrees look like parabolas, so they either both go to positive infinity if the leading coefficient is positive, or they both go to negative infinity as the leading coefficient is negative. So looking at this one, the leading coefficient is positive, so I predict that 4x to the fourth does this, but it gets a little flatter here in the middle, okay? So that means that as x goes to the far left, it still goes up forever. So I'm going to say that it goes to infinity. And they gave me a little thing here. Um, let's try it. There it is, infinity. All right, so I can write INF, right? So I'll write INF again. I think they both go to infinity, All right? Check my answers, and I'm correct. Now, if you're not sure, you can come over to the graph over here and you can actually take a look at it. So let's make this one now 4x to the fourth. And again, it does what I figured it would do. It goes up more steeply than a regular x to the fourth because of the four. So it goes up four times faster. Um, but it still basically looks like x to the fourth. Okay, let's take a look at problem number nine. We have negative 9x to the ninth plus 9x to the fourth plus 9x. Negative 1, 9, and 9 are all real. And the powers on the variable all in the numerator are 9, 4, and 1. Those are all whole numbers. So definitely it's a polynomial. The degree is 9 because the highest in any one term is 9. The degrees of the terms in order are 9, 4, and 1. 9 is the biggest, so it's degree 9, and the leading coefficient is negative. So instead of going up, it's going to reflect and go down. So this is John Travolta like this, okay? I, I don't know how else to do it. It works, right? All right, you'll never forget it. Okay, so for this one, I think it's best that we come over here and kind of sketch it. So what does it look like? The even ones with a positive leading coefficient 
come up and do something like this, or maybe they wiggle in here. I mean, who knows? One or the other. If they're even and they have a negative leading coefficient, then they do the same thing, but you know, maybe they go down like this, or they get flatter in the middle, one or the other. All right, what about our odd ones? Well, our odd ones, if they have a positive leading coefficient, are generally uphill. So they come up, they might wiggle, and then they keep going up. Or they just come up and get real flat and go up. And if they're a negative leading coefficient, like in our example here, then they generally fall. Okay, so from the left to the right. Now you may not know this, but you read a graph from the left side to the right side, and yes, it matters, right? So as you read from the left side to the right side, we would say this is generally uphill because you would push your little car and it would go uphill eventually. And this one would be downhill, okay? It's supposed to be really smooth, but it's not too smooth. Ours has a negative leading coefficient and an odd degree, so it's gotta go like this. So as x goes to the right, positive infinity, y goes to negative infinity. So let's write that down. As x goes to positive infinity, y goes to negative infinity. Right? Now, what happens is x goes to negative infinity. That means as you go to the left across this graph. So as we go to the left, notice the y value goes up forever. So it would go to infinity. And then we can check our answers and we get all greens, which I know it's even satisfying to me. Okay, let's look at this one. This time we've got negative x to the fifth plus 10x to the fourth plus 6x. And we have as x goes to negative infinity. All right, so let's think about this. This one is, well, is it a polynomial even? Well, yeah, it's got negative one, 10, and six. Those are all real, no i. And all the x's are in the numerator. And the powers are five, then four, then one. And the biggest is five, so it's degree five, so it's John Travolta. All right, so Saturday Night Fever, I know you weren't alive. Um, your parents might not even have been alive. I'm embarrassed to say I was alive, but I was very young. Okay, so <laughs> when we're looking at this one, the leading coefficient has to be attached to the x to the fifth. It's a negative one. So this one's got to be downhill. So that's uphill. So this is downhill. All right. So that is going to be this guy again. So as we're looking here at this one, as x goes to the right, y goes down to negative infinity. As x goes to the left, y goes to positive infinity. So as x goes to the right, it goes to negative infinity, I-N-F with a capital I. And as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity. Okay, yay, green. Okay, all right, one more. Eeks, okay, they've kind of messed me up here. All right, so remember what I said, adding polynomials creates another polynomial. Subtracting polynomials creates another polynomial. Raising a polynomial to a whole number power creates another polynomial. Multiplying polynomials creates another polynomial. So let's look at these. So we've got three X to the ninth. Three is real. Nine is a whole number. That is a polynomial. It's a monomial. And then three X to the fourth plus seven X. Three and seven are real. Uh, powers on x are 4 and 1. That is also a polynomial. So I have a monomial times a binomial, which means it is still a polynomial. I need to know, however, what the degree of this one is. In order to know what it looks like, I have to know the degree in the leading coefficient. And I can't know that in factored form. I need to multiply this out. So I have 3x to the ninth. 3x to the fourth plus 7x. Okay, now I need to multiply this out. So my function, all right, so this is going to be distributed property, and I like to draw arrows. Why? 
because that's what I need to do. And it just helps my brain to do it, right? Remember what I said, the more you write, the freer your brain is to do the hard stuff. So write that down. Okay, so three times three, that's nine. X to the nine times X to the fourth, the bases are both X, add the powers. Nine plus four is 13. Okay, now distribute. Three times seven is 21. And X to the ninth times X is gonna be both bases are X. So I add the powers, that's not written, but it's a one. Nine plus one is 10. Okay, this term right here, has degree 13. And this term right here has degree 10. That's bigger, so it's the degree of the whole thing. And so the leading coefficient is nine. Now 13 is odd, but the leading coefficient is positive. So that means that it's gonna be looking like this one right here on the left, all right? Odd with a leading coefficient that is positive. So as X goes to the right, y goes to infinity as x goes to negative infinity y goes to negative infinity so it's generally uphill i don't know why they put these this order i i like it the other way as x goes to the right y goes to infinity and as x goes to the left y goes to negative infinity and you can of course graph these to be sure that you're getting um what you think you're getting, you can always look at them. In fact, let's just look at this one just for fun. So we have three X to the ninth, three X to the fourth plus seven X. Okay, let's so take this guy off. Three X to the ninth, three X to the fourth plus seven X. Whoa, okay, I'll turn that guy off. Well, that's interesting. Okay. So it has two turning points. Now, how many turning points could it have had? It's degree 13, so it could have had 12, right? Maximum is 12, but they come in pairs. So it's either got 12, 10, eight, six, four, two, or none, all right? No turning points where it just kind of goes like this, right? So in this case, it's got two, unless there's one hidden in here somewhere, but it doesn't look like it, right? So it's got two, it's got a turning point way up here near 35, and then it's got the other turning point down here at the origin. Yeah, right there on the graph, okay? All right, so again, as we look at this big picture, end behavior is what happens on the edges of the picture. On the far right, if you ignore the middle part, what happens is X goes to the far right and X goes to the far left. Where does the Y value go? What's the graph look like? Okay, let's take a look at our next problem. We have X plus six quantity squared. Well, x plus six is a polynomial, as it's a line. And then when you raise it to a whole number of power, you still get a polynomial, so it is a polynomial. This one, if I multiplied it out, I know what this is. This is a quadratic function. I've done this before. If I multiply this out, I'm actually gonna get x squared plus 12x plus 36. I know it's degree two, so it's gonna look like a parabola. And the leading coefficient is gonna be a one. But again, the best way to do this would be to actually multiply it out. So we have y equal x plus 6 quantity squared, which becomes x plus 6 times x plus 6. Don't be afraid to write it twice. It helps your brain do the thinking. 6x and 6x is 12x plus 36. This is degree 2. This is degree 1. This is degree zero, degree two is the largest. So the leading coefficient is one. So it's got to look something like a parabola opening up and it will have at most one turning point. And in fact, it has to have one turning point, right? So as we're looking at this, we know that the Y value is going to go to infinity in both cases.
All right. Now this one is a little bit different. This one now asks us to find the intercepts. So what do we mean by intercepts? Let's take a look at some of the graphs that we've got and talk about the intercepts. Now, there is always precisely one y-intercept. Again, remember that the domain is all reals, which includes zero, which means that there has to be a y-intercept. Opposite team gets the ball, so x is zero. So this is the y-coordinate when the x is zero. They all have precisely one. X-intercepts, they might not have any. It is possible, right? If you have an even degree where it never goes below the x-axis or it opens down and never goes above, then there are no x-intercepts. With odd functions, however, they have to cross at least once, right? So they have to have at least one x-intercept. Now, it turns out that the number of x-intercepts is related to the degree. So the degree determines the number of x-intercepts, well, the number of solutions that there are. But you couldn't get the same solution twice. For example, we just did on this one right here, right? So if we're looking at x-intercepts, remember that y is 0, which basically means we get negative 6, but we get it two times. That does count for the two in the degree. So I got negative six twice. And what that actually does is when it's even, it bounces off of that point and then goes back up, right? Which I know that sounds crazy, but that's kind of what it does. So let's take a look at x plus six quantity squared over here on the graph. So we're gonna put in x plus six quantity squared. And I need to come out a little bit and scoot over. Remember what I said, if the solution shows up an even number of times, it's gonna bounce off of the x-axis at that coordinate. So you can see that it's bouncing off at negative six because I got negative six as a solution and x-intercept two times, right? So it's gonna definitely bounce off of there. And I think a few minutes ago, we had one that was higher. What if I had something that was like x to the sixth to the fourth? Well, it's still gonna bounce off of that spot because it's there four times. On the other hand, if it's there five times, what does that change? Well, it changes it from an even degree polynomial to an odd degree, but notice that it still has at least one x-intercept, which is at six, negative six and you get that solution five times, so that counts for the five possibilities. In other words, the degree tells you how many solutions there are. It just may be that one solution shows up more than once, and we call that multiplicity, all right? So a solution can be found, and again, we're looking for solutions are when y equals zero, but that's also going to give us the x-intercepts, right? So in this case, we got x equal negative six two times, and we call that multiplicity two, right? So multiplicity is how many times you got that particular solution um, as an answer to the equation when y equals zero. There's only one x-intercept though, and that's gonna be negative six, zero. So solutions and x-intercepts, we often use them interchangeably, but actually they are a little bit different, right? So roots and solutions means the same things. All right, so let's now go back over here to our problem and look at this equation that we've got right here. We've got negative quantity x plus four, quantity x plus one, quantity x plus two. Let's write that down. So this is a function, so you can write f of x or you could write y. Negative x plus four, x plus two, x plus one. I believe that's what we had over here. Well, yes, the order is backwards, but it doesn't actually matter because when you multiply, you can change the order around its commutative. 
Okay, so when we're looking at this one, I'm sure my sound is still on. If I want to find the y-intercept, I have to let x be zero. And when I want to find the x-intercept or intercepts, I let y be zero. So the x-intercept or septs, because there could be more than one, or none, that's also a possibility, is going to happen when y is equal to zero. So I get zero equals negative times x plus four times x plus one times x plus two. Well, the negative, I could multiply both sides by a negative. So basically, I can go ahead and use the zero product property as it's written. And I can say, well, this is going to be zero if x plus four is zero, or x plus one is zero, or x plus two equals zero, in which case I get three possibilities, negative four, negative one, and negative two. All right. Now you may go, oh, what are those? They're the places where it touches or crosses the x-axis. Now to bounce off the x-axis and come off on the same side, they have to have even multiplicity. And these were all found precisely once. So in fact, it has to cross the axis there. So in this case, we have three x-intercepts, negative four, zero, negative one, zero, and negative two, oops, close my parentheses too early, zero, right? So that gives us three points. Now, how, what does that mean as far as the picture goes? Well, that means that if I'm looking at a graph like here, and I mark off two, three, four, there's five, I know it crosses here, crosses here, oh, and it crosses here. So I've got those three crossing points. All right, I got that. Um, if I multiplied it out, what would the highest degree be? Well, I'd get an x times an x times an x, which would be x cubed. So this is going to have an x cubed. What would the leading coefficient be? Well, I'd have this negative here, this negative one from the front. And then I have this one x times one x times one x. Now, what did I do? I pulled out the leading coefficient in the form it's written, and I multiplied it by the highest degree term in each set of parentheses. And this would give me a negative x cubed. So this thing has to look overall like a negatively sloped cubic. It's gonna come downhill like this. So when I look at negative x cubed, it's gotta generally come down like this, and then it's gotta go down towards negative infinity here. So, but it's gotta be smooth and connected. So it's gotta turn around somewhere in here and look something like that, right? Has to. Now, do I know that it really turns around here and here? No, I don't. I don't know um, that it's turning around right at those locations right there. It could actually be way higher or way lower. I don't know. But I know that roughly it looks like this. Now, I have one more piece of information that I could actually find out, and that would be the y-intercept. So the y-intercept, again, all polynomials have precisely one, and there's only one. And this turns out to be when x is zero. So what do I do? So I find f of zero, which is going to be a negative times, well, zero plus four is four, zero plus one is one, and zero plus two is two, which gives me a negative eight. All right, so what does that tell me? That tells me that on my graph over here, when it crosses right there, I know that's the ordered pair zero, negative eight. All right, and this gives us a way of ballparking what the picture is going to look like. Let's see how close we got by looking at our function in Desmos. So negative x plus 4, x plus 1, x plus 2. All right, so negative x plus 4, x plus 1 x plus 2. All right. Well, yeah, 
ballparking, it's pretty good. Um, back to the default zoom. So yeah, it didn't actually go that low or come that high. And is it crossing right there at negative eight? Yes, right there, right? Desmos will eventually catch you right on the, um, right on the spot if you put it right there. It also will tell you exactly where the highs and the low points are right here. And it will let you know exactly what the X intercepts are and notice they're exactly what we thought they would be. Negative four, zero, negative two, zero, and negative one, zero. So now let's go back to our equation right here. And we want to put in our Y intercept. Um, now it says enter intercepts as points. So that means as an ordered pair. So this should be zero, oops, I forgot my comma, comma, negative eight, right? That was the y-intercept. And the x-intercepts are negative four, zero, um, negative, oops, I've got to put a comma in between them, okay? Comma, and then negative two, did I open it? I did. Negative two, comma, zero, close, comma, open and negative one comma zero close. All right, now we know these are correct because we've already looked at the graph, but it is always nice to get the green. Okay, let's talk about this one right here. We have x cubed plus 64, and we wanna know what it looks like. Now, it was easier to find the intercepts when it was in this factored form. So let's see if we can factor this guy. So our function is y equals x cubed plus 64. Now this does in fact factor, it is the sum of two cubes. So remember your formula, a cubed plus b cubed equals a plus b times, square the first, multiply them together, but change the sign and square the last. So we get that. So this is going to be, x plus four, the cube root of 64 is four. That's a plus and so that's a plus. The signs in the middle are both plus. Now we square the x to get x squared. We multiply the four and the x together to get four x, but we make the sign be opposite for what's in the binomial. And then we square the four to get 16. All right, now if we use the zero product property, we know that we're going to have x intercepts, possibly, don't have to have them, when y is zero. So we get zero equal x plus four, x squared minus four x plus 16. So definitely, if x plus four equals zero, then we have at least x equal negative four. So we have negative four, zero. And then we have this quadratic x squared minus 4x plus 16, which equals zero. And when we look at this one, if we want to solve this one, we could try factoring. It's not going to factor. You can try, but it's not going to, right? That's typical coming out of the summer difference of two cubes. It won't factor. Um, and then what else could we do? Uh, we could complete the square. That would work. And then use the square root property. Or we could do the quadratic formula. If I'm gonna do the quadratic formula, I wanna make sure that these are actual x-intercepts. They will be solutions no matter what, they are solutions, but I wanna make sure that they're actually gonna be x-intercepts because this problem is asking for x-intercepts, not solutions, not the roots. Now, if I'm doing that, I wanna look for what's called the discriminant and the discriminant basically is the part under the radical, the b squared minus 4ac. If it's not positive in a perfect square, um, well, no, if it's just not positive, if it's negative, I'm gonna get an i. That will be a solution. It does count as a solution, but it doesn't count as an x-intercept. Now this is third degree, so there have to be three solutions, but some of them could have I in them. So let's take a look at the discriminant, which is B squared minus four AC. And my B here, of course, A equals one, 
B equals negative four and C equals 16. And so when I'm looking at that, I'm going to have negative four squared minus four times one times 16. This gives me 16 minus 64. That's negative. All right. Um, in fact, it turns out to be a negative 48. Right. So if I have that, um, yikes. Well, that means that my solutions have an I in them. Remember, if we were looking for solutions, we would do negative B over 2A plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC. That's where the discriminant comes from, all over 2A, which would give me the opposite of a negative 4 is 4 over 2 times 1 plus or minus the square root of a negative 48 over 2 times 1. And this would give me a 2 plus or minus. Well, the negative comes out as i, and 48 is 16 times 3. So I've got a 16 times 3, which gives me a 4 on the outside, the square root of 3, and it's all divided by 2, which gives me 2 plus or minus 2i square roots of 3. That's two solutions, 2 plus 2i square roots of 3 and 2 minus 2i square root of 3. That counts as two solutions. And then the negative 4 is the third solution. That takes care of all three. But these don't graph on the real number line because of the i. So we really only have one x-intercept, which is negative 4, 0. Now, what about the y-intercept? Well, that one's actually really easy. I can just tell by looking. If I were to look at this one, and I were to replace x with 0, I'd get 64. So the y-intercept is 0, 64. And remember, it always has to have a y-intercept in precisely 1. It does not have to have x-intercepts unless it's odd. If it's odd, it only has to have 1, but it could have more than 1. And again, that's because they're stretched like this. So at some point, it has to cross. There are no holes or gaps in those graphs. And the odd ones do like this, one arm up, one arm down. So somewhere it's got to cross the x-axis at least once. All right, so let's enter our information here, enter as points. So we have, um, what did I say this was? 0, 64. And this one was negative 4, 0. And then we can check our answers and we've got the lovely green. All right, now we have a different kind of problem. This one says determine the least possible degree of the polynomial function. I like these, they're super um, straightforward, um, at least for me, and hopefully they will be for you after this. The thing to do is to count the turning points. So remember over here that we defined turning points where did I define turning points? The maximum number of turning points is the degree minus one. So if you count the turning points and add one, you'll get the smallest possible degree. Now it could be higher than that with going by twos. So looking at this one and looking at the basic shape, it's got this with a wiggle in it, right? So it's gotta be at least cubic, right? I have two turning points, so I add one, I get three. It could be degree three or degree five or seven or nine or 11 or any odd three or higher, but the smallest possible would be three. Now let's look at this next one. This one is kind of fun. Notice that it is coming downhill, but again, it's got one arm up, one arm down. So it's got to be odd, right? The even ones are like this with wiggles in the middle or flat, you know, something like this or like this. But that both arms go in the same direction. So this has got to be odd, has to be odd. Now, what would the degree be? Let's count these turning points. I've got one, two, three, four. I've got four turning points. So if I have four turning points, it's at least degree five. Could be five, seven, nine, eleven, but at least five. So the least possible degree here is five. 
let's look at this guy. Well, it's only got two turning points. And even though they didn't show me much of the graph, I can still see I've got one arm up, one arm down. It's got to be at least one more than the number of turning points. So at least three could be five, seven, nine, 11, et cetera, but at least three. What about this guy? Well, now this guy, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll admit to you, I don't like this problem. Uh, <laughs> why do I not like this problem? I don't think there's enough detail in here. Okay, so do we count this as a turning point? I'm going to say no, but I can see where a student might think that it actually has a bend to it. Sometimes these bends are so subtle that they're hard to see with the naked eye, and that's why we need calculus. Calculus will let us find it exactly. But I'm going to say that this comes down and flattens out and then goes down again, like a cubic. So it's not actually a wiggle. It's just a flat part. So I would say that this really only has one turning point. Now, looking at this one, though, because of the shape of it, um, it's not a parabola, right? Because of this right here, I'm going to say it's got to be at least degree four, right? Because it's got this saddle point in it right here. So a saddle point is one of those spots where it kind of comes down and then does that. It's kind of like the saddle on a mountain, right? You're hiking. You think you're reaching the top. You get up and you're like, oh, crud, you know, because it flattens out and then it goes up again, right? That's a saddle point. So I think this has to be at least degree four. So let's see what it says, but I'm going to say at least degree four. I could be wrong. Ah, yay. Okay. Let's look at the next one. What about this guy? Well, this looks like a parabola to me. So it could be a higher degree than that, though it's not very flat on the bottom. So I'm going to guess that the least degree has got to be a two, All right? Parabola. All right. Now let's take a look at these graphs right here. When we talk about the general shape of polynomials, we've been looking at polynomials. And remember that basically our polynomials look something like these graphs that you see right here in the picture. They wiggle or they get flattish, right? Or they can have saddle points, um, but they're smooth and connected and either both arms go up or both arms go down if it's degree even, or one arm goes up and one arm goes down if it's degree odd. So let's take a look at these graphs over here and see what differences we see. Well, first off, this one right here does not have a value when x is zero. So that is clearly not a polynomial, right? Polynomials are defined for all real, so that's not. Now, this one's got a corner right here, and polynomials are smooth, right? No corners or cusps. So that's not a polynomial. And this one right here, this arm is approaching the x-axis. It's not going up or down, so that's not polynomial. But this one does go up and then it has a saddle point right here in the middle and then it goes down. So I'm not sure if you can see this. So looking at B, B is out because it doesn't have a value when X is zero. D is out because one arm approaches the X axis and doesn't go to infinity or negative infinity. C is out because it's got a corner that leaves A. And A looks like a cubic, All right? And we can check and move on. Now, looking at the next set of problems here, A is smooth, right? And it does have wiggles, but notice that it keeps wiggling in this pattern and the arms don't both go up or both go down or one go up and one go down. That looks more like a sine function. So that is not, in fact, a polynomial. Now we're looking at this B. B is the same one we saw previously where one arm of it is approaching the x-axis. That's not a polynomial. Polynomials don't have corners or cuts. They're smooth. So C is out. That leaves us with D. All right, so looking at the next problems, 
we've already eliminated A because of the corner, C because one branch goes towards the x-axis and not to infinity or negative infinity, and D is out because, again, the edges of the graph don't approach infinity or negative infinity, and all polynomials either both go up, both go down, or one goes up, one goes down. So that leaves us with B as the only option. All right. Now, when we're looking at this one, we want to determine the x-intercepts and the end behavior. And this one, I think, will allow us to actually graph it in here. So if we want to graph it in here, we can put in 3x to the third, parentheses, 3x minus 7, All right? And then click on the little arrow there and it will kind of go down for you. So you can see this right here. Now it's really narrow. So let's decrease our X values to maybe negative five to five and see if that brings it in tighter so that we can see it. All right, so that's a, that's a little better there. So we're seeing this one right here. Both arms appear to be going up. That means it's gotta be even degree. And when I'm looking at this one, remember that to find the leading term, you take the highest degree term in each factor and multiply them together with any constant at the front. So I've got a 3x cubed times a 3x, which gives me a 9x to the fourth. Nine is positive, so they do both go up. X to the fourth, they both go up. Right? It basically looks like that with a saddle point here at the origin and then a turning point down here. And again, it is x to the fourth. So x-intercepts. x-intercepts, we will need to come over to our paper over here and work that out. So we have 3x cubed times 3x minus 7. So we have 3x cubed times 3x minus 7. So for x-intercepts, we have zero equal three x cubed times three x minus seven. So three x cubed equals zero or three x minus seven equals zero. So this, if I divide by three, I get x cubed equals zero. And when I take the cube root of both sides, I get x equals zero. Over here, I can add the seven to both sides and then divide by three to get seven Third. So I have two x-intercepts, the origin and seven-thirds. And let's make sure, does that match our picture? Yeah, it looks pretty close. Seven-thirds, it's not, oh, it's not working exactly like it normally does. Oh, there it is. So that is seven-thirds. So I know that my intercepts, um, and it only is asking for the x-intercepts, the x-intercepts are going to be comma separated list of points. Okay, so zero comma zero. And what was the other one? Seven thirds. All right, seven divided by three comma zero. And as X goes to infinity, the Y value, which is F of X goes to infinity. And as X goes to well, I said infinity the first time, negative infinity. And now as it goes to infinity, it still goes to infinity. And we can check our answers and then we've got all green bars. All right. So I will leave you to do the next one on your own. It's very similar to the one we did before. Um, just be careful with your signs. It's got negatives in there. If you multiply the negative 3x cubed times the negative 3x, you've got a double negative. So I should get a positive 9x to the fourth again. So they should both go up, right? Spike those negatives there. All right. Now, again, this is one that's a little bit different. So I do want to look at this one. This one has 2 minus x, 2x minus 1, and x squared minus 2.
So let's make sure that I copied this down correctly. 2x minus 1. All right. So to find the leading term, I'm going to take the constant that's at the front, which is a 1, and multiply by the highest degree term in each individual parentheses. So this would be a negative x. The highest degree term in the next parentheses is 2x, and the highest degree term in the last one is x squared. Now this gives me a negative 2x to the 4th. Now, because of that, I know that it's got to be going down. So it's got to look something like this. And it could have wiggles. It either has one turning point or three. The degree is four. And the leading coefficient is negative two. And the turning points is either going to be three or one, right? Remember, they come in pairs. So either it wiggles once, twice, three times, or it just gets flattish and then comes down, right? One turning point. Okay, so when we're looking at this one, we want the intercepts, just the x-intercepts. So again, take each individual one and set it equal to zero and solve. So when we're looking for x-intercepts, we know that y is equal to zero. So we have zero equal two minus x times two x minus one times x squared minus two. So I get two minus x equals zero. Move the x, so you get x equal two. Or two x minus one is zero, move the one, and then divide by two, so I get one half. Or I have, now hang on a minute. This is concerning, because I only have three factors here. But the degree up here is a four. And if the degree is four, there should be four solutions. So either one of them turns up twice, because I've got two so far, or this last one's going to give me two solutions, because there's got to be four solutions. But they don't all have to be x-intercepts. If they have an i in them, their solutions are roots, but they're not x-intercepts. So x squared minus 2 equals 0, move the 2. x squared equal 2, ah, there's got to be 2. So it's got to be plus or minus the square root of 2. So I'm going to have 2, 0, 1 half, 0. The square root of 2, 0. And negative square root of 2, 0. All right, those are going to be my x-intercepts. Now, as x goes to negative infinity, I said it has a negative, so it's going to go down to negative infinity. So this is going to be negative i n f, and this one's also going to be negative infinity. And then I've got to list these in here. So what did we find again? 2, 1 half. So 2 comma 0, um, 1 half comma 0, uh, square root of 2. I think it will let me do this, comma 0, and negative square root. Put the 2 in parentheses. And then don't forget to close your parentheses up. All right, so, and again, I could graph it and look at it right here, and it would show me exactly what it looks like. But I've done it algebraically. Let's see. Ooh, what? Oh, I left my zero out. So let me go back to my answer here. My zero got on the wrong side of the parentheses, and I erased it. So let's check it again, and we have all green. Okay, so I will let you go ahead and find this one on this next one. On this one, it's going to be cubic, which means one arm will go up and one arm will go down. And the next one, we have 3x cubed times 2x minus 6. So the leading terms in each factor are going to be 
3x cubed times 2x, which will give us 6x to the fourth. So it's going to look like an x to the fourth. Since 6 is positive, it's going to go up like that. All right. And then the last one is going to be a word problem. So let's go ahead and copy this one off and take a look at it. So for word problems, remember we need to read it through one time, get a vague idea of some formulas that might be important and ignore all the others. Then we'll go back and we'll cut it apart. And we'll go by the parts of speech, subject phrase, verb phrase, prepositional phrase, subordinate clauses, punctuation, every two to three words basically. And we'll divide it out and we'll draw a picture and we'll get all the information down on the page. An oil slick is expanding as a circle. The radius of the circle is currently 4.5 inches and is increasing at a rate of 8.5 inches per hour. Express the area of the circle A as a function of H, the number of hours elapsed. Answer should be A of H equals some function of H in a pi as pi. Okay, PI. All right, so for the following exercise, use the written statement to construct a polynomial function that represents the required information. All right, well, all I got was it's an oil slick and it's increasing as a circle. And they want me to find the area, so I got that. All right, circle. Well, what's important about a circle? Uh, well, the area of it is pi r squared, so I know that. So I should write that down. So I know the area of a circle is going to be equal to pi times the radius squared. All right, let's go back and let's start drawing a picture and labeling things. And then we'll see what we need to do from there. Okay, so going back to the beginning, and again, we're going to go about every two to three words where you would normally pause. An oil slick, got it, is expanding, getting bigger. Okay, so at one point in time, it looks like that. And at another point in time, it looks like that, all right? It's expanding, okay? So it's getting bigger. As a circle, well, it wouldn't be a square or a rectangle or a triangle, would it? No, they increase roughly as circles, all right? The radius, that's R, of the circle, got it, is currently 4.5 inches. Okay, well, this is going to be now, and this is going to be later. You know, there's candies called now and laters. When I was a kid, I grew up in Texas, and accents were so strong, I thought they were called nihilators, because when people said now and later, it sounded like nihilator. I never caught on to that until I was an adult. I hate to admit that, but that's true. Okay, so this is R equals... 4.5 inches, all right, and is increasing, okay, got that, at a rate, okay, of 8.5 inches per hour. Okay, now I got to play what if. In one hour, what's the radius going to be? Well, one hour would be another 8.5 inches, so 4.5 and 8.5, that's 13, all right, and then what about another hour after that, so two hours later? Well, that would be two times the 8.5, so that's 17, plus the 4.5 it started at, so that would be 21.5, right? Okay, so what am I doing? Um, I'm saying that the radius has to start at 4.5 inches, and then I have to take the 8.5 inches, and I have to multiply by the number of hours, and that gives me the radius. Okay, yeah, that works. Okay, express the area, got it, of the circle, already have, it's pi r squared. A as a function of H, O, the number of hours elapsed, okay. So I need to rewrite this so that instead of R, I've got H in there. So, well, I can just substitute 4.5 plus 8.5 times h. And then remember, I've got to square the radius, and that makes it a polynomial function. 
Okay, so pi times 4.5 plus 8.5 h quantity squared. And when you look at the answer, I know I cheated. I can do this, you can't, but that is in fact the correct answer. Notice they wrote it in the opposite order, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's the same because it's addition, so you can commute the order. That's our last problem. So I hope that you've enjoyed this and I hope you'll join me for our next video.